All right. In this video, I want to talk about preaching and preaching not just the gospel, but the hard things. You see, uh, I was uh, hearing a story about someone who felt uncomfortable preaching about certain things. Uh, they wanted to, but they didn't want to preach out against something like homosexuality or transgenderism because they thought that would push more people away than bring people in. And that should not be your focus. Your focus should be on just preaching and preaching the truth and allowing the people to decide whether they're going to accept it or not. Whether they accept it or not is not on you. Even if you present the truth in a way that is harsh, rude, inconsiderate, in your face, like what we normally wouldn't do, but you do it anyway, it's still on them whether they accept it or reject it, right? So you don't need to focus on that. Uh, for a couple examples I'll give you is looking at someone like Joel Olstein, right? He doesn't really like to preach on the hard stuff about, oh, you, you only can go through Jesus Christ and doesn't really talk hard about homosexuality and transgenderism and all that stuff. He's basically just preaching God loves you and he wants you to be prosperous. That's like the main focus of his message, telling people want to hear. And he has a huge church. I think the biggest one, at least in the States, right? And that's like a so what thing. Right? He's not giving them the truth. So who cares that he has so many people listening to him? What's the point of him not giving them the truth and having all of them there? And then you look at someone like Jeremiah, the one that people call chosen of God but rejected of men, the, the weeping prophet. He just preached the truth and he didn't get anybody to follow him. He even had God tell him to I'll write out a scroll, and he gave it to the king of Israel, and he just threw it in the fire. So he just wasn't accepted, right? But he was giving the people the truth, but he didn't get anybody to accept the truth. Not a one of them, right? So the example you can learn from these two people is that Oh, yeah, you can get a lot of people to follow you when you, you blow smoke up their ass and tell them what they want to hear. But so what? How is that benefiting anybody? It's not. But if you tell them the truth, hey, they might walk away, but you might have planted some seeds or did some watering. Given some light that later on. That becomes actually fruitful, that actually becomes beneficial, even if they end up walking away. They might, might remember some of the things you said. They think about those things and they start asking questions, whether they asking other people the questions, they start looking it up on, in, on their own library, internet, or they start praying to God about it. And then that leads them to the gospel, leads them to the truth, right? So even though they rejected you, you don't know the effect you might have actually had on anybody who's listening. Or you had an effect on somebody who's listening, they reject you, but they repeat what you said because it irritated them. And they repeat what you said to their family or to their friends because they were just complaining about you. And Yeah, this guy who was saying all this stuff I didn't like. And through them, you planted seeds to a whole other group of people that you weren't even talking to in the first place. Right? You just don't know how it's all going to work out. I'm just giving you some examples. Of God just does his thing. And if you feel convicted to say something, to do something, you ought to do it. If there's some fear in it, it's probably because God is wanting you to do it. You just feel uncomfortable about it, which I understand. I felt that. I know a lot of people probably feel that. But what you got to do in a moment like that is pray to God. Like, hey, I need help. Uh, open a door for me here because I don't know how to engage in this. And even admit the truth to him, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to say something. I'm afraid of the backlash. I know I ought to say something, but I don't want to deal with how I think people are going to react. 
and then take it from there. Sometimes the anxiety will go away. Sometimes somebody will go, hey, you praying? And all of a sudden you open the door and just start talking about God, which leads to you doing what you were originally convicted to do, right? So, you no, don't worry about those kind of things, right? Uh, such as people not actually coming to the gospel because you said things they didn't like. No, they weren't going to come to it anyway, right? They just want you to say things that they want to hear. We see that throughout the scriptures where Israel is upset out about certain prophets because they don't, those prophets don't tell them what they want to hear. They tell them horrible things, right? The truth. They don't like it. So what? It's the truth. Are you supposed to not say the truth just because it upsets people? So I'll show you a couple examples of here about it not being a big deal. Jeremiah was one, but here Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21 He's preaching to the people here. Check this out. Verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him a, the book of the prophet Isaiah. I know that says with an E, but that's the New Testament rendering of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance unto the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And in this verse, I believe is Isaiah 41, if I remember correctly, it doesn't end right there. It talks about uh, the wrath of God coming. But Jesus is talking about what he's doing now. So he stopped there abruptly, and it says, and he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister and sat down. So you see here, he just read that short part, because the second part is not what he's here to do at the moment, right? He goes on to say, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Right there, Jesus saying, I'm the Messiah. This was speaking about me. Here I am. Right? So as soon as he starts his ministry, he's already saying, hey, I'm the Messiah. Right from the beginning. The problem is people didn't believe. And what happens? They all like, get out of here. And they start driving him out of the temple. Or the synagogue, I should say. My bad. Uh, synagogue is just a gathering of people. It's not a building. It's not the temple. Uh, just to clarify, uh, but they uh, start uh, pushing them out, and uh, I am not sure if this is where it talks about it. Let's see. This is also written in Matthew and Mark. So let's go over here. Maybe this is where it talks about what happened to him. Should have quoted there. Let me go down. Maybe it's down here. No. This is not where it says it. So let's go over here to Matthew 2.19. Okay, it says here that they were offended, right? In this account of it. Uh, but that's not what we're, we're looking at. We're going to look at what they actually did. Okay, it might be this one. Again, okay, okay, that's talking about them being offended. Is this the same passage? Oh, okay, I clicked on two different ones here. My bad. Oh, the same one. Okay, I guess it's going to mark them. Sorry for about all this. Let's go to Mark. Um, I don't remember what verses it was. It's 1 through 6. Now that's weird. I'm probably overlooking it. 
but in this story, they get upset with him. They drive him out. Oh yeah, it is right here. Verse 28, it says in Luke 4, in all of the city, and I'm sorry, and all of they in the synagogue, when they heard these things were filled with wrath, right? They didn't like that he said that he's the Messiah, but it's the truth. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and let him onto the brow of the hill where on the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. So they wanted to throw him over a cliff here. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. So sorry that I brought you through all these different ones, but it was right there all along. My bad. But, uh, yeah, so they wanted to kill him because of what he said. But Jesus still said it, right? So he wasn't worried about the reaction. Uh, neither was Paul. He got stoned and... He was unconscious. They left him for dead. He came to. He went right back into the city and started preaching again. Right? So he didn't care about the reaction he got. Because it's not about their reaction. It's about you being a faithful witness and being a faithful watchman and telling people the truth. And it's up to them to accept it or not. Like we read in the Old Testament about being a watchman on the wall. That if you see the enemy coming and you don't warn the people, their blood is on your hands. Yet, if you warn the people and they don't listen, their blood is upon their own head. So it's not about you getting them to listen and obeying. It's about you just telling them. If they don't listen, well, that's on them. Right? Nothing you can do about that. So you shouldn't worry about them accepting or rejecting because you're talking about the hard things. Like you're saying homosexuality is a sin. And I know a lot of them will say, well, so is uh, adultery and fornication. Like, yes, it is. Those are sins too. But that doesn't make homosexual any less of a sin. Well, why aren't you preaching out against uh, adultery and fornication? I do. But at the moment, I'm preaching about homosexuality being a sin. Right? They, they, they just want to get away from the fact that it is what it is. Because it, it's weird when you preach about, hey... Fornication and adultery is a sin. A lot of people will do one of two things. They'll either be like, you're right, and uh, well, I'm not, a, I, I don't do those things, so I'm not worried about it. Or they're like, okay, I've done these things. I know they're wrong. I want to turn from it. Or they'll do those things and they'll be like, I don't care. And they just walk away, right? But when you preach against homosexuality, there's a different spirit because with homosexuals, it's not that they have a sexuality to them. It's that they identify with that. So if you preach against adultery and fornication, people who commit adultery and fornication don't think, oh, my whole identity is about being a adulterer or a fornicator. They just think that's something that I do. And yes, what I do is wrong, right? But they don't take offense that you're attacking me. They're like, no, you're attacking what I've done. Like if you stole something, if you lied, they understand that you're attacking what they've done, not them. What they did was wrong, and they need to correct that. But with the homosexual, it tends to be that, no, you're attacking me. You're not attacking my sin. You're attacking me because I am homosexuality. <laughs> That's pretty much their reaction to it. It's like it's not nothing against you. We're all sinners. We all have different sins that uh, tempt us and pull us away. Yours happens to be homosexuality, and that's a sin. Whether you like to admit that or not, that is what it is. If you take that as a personal attack, that's on you. You worked that out with God. You know, I didn't create God. I didn't create the Word of God. I didn't create how things work. That's just how it is. You don't have to like it, but it is what it is. You may not like the law of your country, but the law of your country is what it is. Nothing you can do about that. You have to accept that, right? Same thing goes with God or with your parents. You may not like the rules they have set for you growing up, but they are what they are. Deal with it. You take it as a personal attack all you want. It doesn't change the fact, right? And you may be saying, well, 
I can't not be a homosexual. Okay. But you don't have to engage in it. It's not fair. I got to be celibate. It is what it is. Just like these guys who want to be. What's the word? It's not polygamous, right? They, they want to spread their seed to every woman. And they'll, they, whether they want them all as wives or just as toys, basically, right? They naturally desire to do that. They don't want to be married and be want to one woman. But if they want to please God, they have to go against their nature and what they desire to do. I mean, a lot of women now, they don't want to get married either. And they just want to fool around. But they have to deny themselves and accept what God has put forth. We all have to do that. Right? And to take it as, oh, you're picking on homosexuals. It's just you not wanting to uh, deal with the issue and you want the person to shut up about it. Right? You talk about transgenderism. And it's the same kind of issue, right? Same thing. It's like, why don't you talk to men and women about this? Why is it always about uh, children? Your children that are very impressionable. You're, you're trying to get say that they, they're really the opposite gender, and you give them life-altering surgeries that can't be changed. They can't be reversed. So why would you do that? Why don't you wait for them to be an adult? Right? Why, why don't we have all these adults making this choice? Why is it always... The youth doing this. That you don't think that's uh strange? Like you're victimizing the youth, manipulating them. That's what it that's what it is. It's a sin. Completely changing what you are, not accepting what you are. Grass is greener on the other side. I always thought it was weird where a guy says, I feel like I'm a woman or a woman, I feel like I'm a man. Well, how do you know what it's like to feel like the opposite gender? You don't know. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. If I say, oh, I feel like a woman. I have no idea what that's like. If a woman says, oh, I feel like a man. She has no idea what that feels like. She's just having feelings and then, or he's having feelings. And then they just assume that, oh, this is because I'm the opposite gender. No, it's a feeling, and you don't know how to understand it and express it. Most likely, it's just sexual perversion. We all have these kind of sins. We all like kinky stuff, whether we're going to admit it or not. There's things that we don't understand, but they get our rocks off, right? Pardon my French there. I'm trying to use some terms that aren't uh, too vulgar for people. But, you know, we get our jollies from weird things, if we're being honest. Uh, maybe some of us grew up Christian, and we never did anything. So maybe that's not something that uh, you have to worry about. But for people who live in the world, in the world today, and you, you've lived the party life, doing the drinking and the drugs, you've probably got into weird things. You got into pornography. It probably got out of hand and you started watching some weird things, right? So now weird things get you going. We all have to deal with that. Yes, sin, bad, wrong. And you got to deal with that. It's not, oh, we're it's picking on homosexuals. No, it's just saying, hey, that's a sin. What's really going on is you just want people to be quiet about it, right? And the same thing with uh, transgenderism. They don't want you de defending the youth. Their parents aren't going to do it. So they're like, you shut up. Let us do this to the children. But what about all the people who had the transitions and they regret it and they commit suicide? You say you do this to save their lives, to keep them from kill killing themselves, but they become more likely to kill themselves after the surgery than if they didn't have the surgery. Oh no. What is this hate speech now? Because I don't, I'm not agreeing with what the so-called science is. 
what the media says. You can't be afraid of to how people react to this. And if you got uh, a problem talking about these things, uh, I suggest two things. One is uh, you can start by doing what like I'm doing here. When you preach online like this, you get used to talking and putting your thoughts out and answering questions and dealing with reactions without people actually able to get in your face and have that conflict where things could get violent, right? You don't have to worry about anything like that. So you can get used to it. And then you can just do things like put what you what you want to say on a shirt. And you can wear the shirt so you don't even have to actually be saying anything. If people read your shirt, well, okay, you, they got the message. And sometimes they read the shirt and that's what gets them to engage you. And when somebody engages you, I find it to be easier than you trying to engage somebody to get into a conversation because a lot of times they're just like piss off. But if you get them to engage you, it opens the door. And now you can get into the conversation. And you don't have to hit them hard with things like I was saying in this video. Like even if they are a homosexual doing transgender stuff or whatever, you don't even have to talk about that. Even if it's a guy in a dress and makeup you're talking to, you don't even have to address the sin. Right? If it comes up, don't be afraid to talk about it. You're like, yeah, it's a sin. But show them that you're going to talk to them like a human being. Right? And, and get to know them. Try to. Right? Don't enable what they're doing. But at first, don't sit there and just point out their sin and condemn it either. Talk to them. And you can talk to them about sin in general and our sinful natures. That we naturally want to go against God. We want to do our own thing. And if you feel like it, be like, you're a perfect example of it, right? God has set up men and women to be together. And for men to be men and women to be women. And you're doing the opposite because you naturally want to go against God. You're an example of our rebellious nature. So you can tell them the truth without pointing the finger and condemning them to hell, but getting them to think about it. So they might get upset that you're saying that. Being like, hey, why are you getting mad at me? This is just how God set it up. I believe the Bible. I'm just sharing with you what the Bible says. I mean, if that bothers you, I mean, that bothers you. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. All right? So you don't have to sit there and just slap people in the face with the truth. But you can't be afraid to have to do that either. But these kind of things can help you do just that. Uh... Now, another example is Paul here. This is a pretty cool one here. Uh, I think everybody turned on him on this one, right? Because you got to understand that we're all basically preaching against idols because people make an idol out of uh, whether it's their church, whether they're Christian or not, you know, out of their religion, their false god that's kind of obvious. Sometimes they actually have idols, like the Catholic Church or something. And there's times where uh, people make an idol out of the government, their political party, uh, the political party's leader. Uh, there's people who make idols out of uh, some professor, somebody in that kind of field that they really like. Sometimes it's a uh, celebrity of some kind that they idolize. A lot of times, ultimately, it's themselves and their own opinions. And they like to set themselves up as God. So you need to realize that that's what we're doing. We're destroying idols, false gods, because that's what people have done. And this is a pretty good example of it, that you can't be afraid to break the idol right in front of their face. Right? As we read here in Acts 19, at verse 23, it says, At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. And this is the way of the Christian. This is Paul's preaching the way. And it goes on to say, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines of Diana, 
brought no small gain onto the craftsmen. Craftsmen. See, he's making money by making idols. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. And you know that there's a lot of people, they make money through their idolatry, right? Such as uh, religions. Going to pick on the Catholic Church here. They have their idolatry thing going on. And they make money by getting people to think that they're one, the one true church, that they need to go through them to go to God. So they go there, they pay their tithes. And then they spend money buying these crucifixes and these rosary beads and idols. And then the, the church itself has to spend the money to buy uh, wafers and wine and say that it's, you know, from heaven and whatnot. And, uh, uh, yeah, you got this business going. And then when someone like me or you preaches against this, you're destroying a business, their livelihood. As the Catholic Church, they don't have jobs. They're not contributing to society. They're leeching off of society. And if you take away their victim, the people, well, how are they going to make a living? And you see that's what's going on here. You see the same thing with the government. Oh, you don't want to support the government. Well, where is it going to get its money? People think, oh, it's government paid, government uh, supported. Oh, that means you're doing it with your tax money, right? So if all the people turn away from that, the government collapses. And then a lot of leeches off of society, well, they're flapping on the ground, drying up, right? Like, like a, a leech. And then uh, a lot of times, even with these lesser things, like uh, the people who support Donald Trump, and they got um, his images that they're buying. I forgot what they call those things online, these special digital images. You can buy that, and you can buy other kind of merchandise. And then the same thing with Black Lives Matter and Antifa and transgender and the rainbow stuff. There's all kinds of merchandise that's made off of these things, right? So when you start tearing down what's going on, you're destroying people's livelihoods, leeches that are leeching off of the people with these ideologies that just suck their money out of them, right? Their time and their money. So the people who are leeching going to get upset. And that's what we see going on here. So it goes on to say at verse 26, Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Uh, today, this goddess is known as uh, the Virgin Mary. Not that the Virgin Mary is a pagan goddess, but they just took her name and put it on this pagan goddess. So it's kind of like Satan calling himself Jesus. It's not that Jesus is Satan and a pagan god. It's that they're giving Christian names and putting it on pagan deities. Right? Just to make that clear goes on to say, and when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in onto the people, the disciples suffered him not. So he was going to go preach to them. But they were like, no, 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 no. And certain of the chief of Asia which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Uh, so some of these people were all joining in, but they didn't know why. they just kind of going with the motions there, going with the flow. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people, but they, but when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now you could read more about this, uh, you feel free, obviously. And uh, 
we get the, the idea here that they rejected the gospel message, right? And for two hours, they were chanting about their pagan deity. You can see like Catholics probably doing that about praying to Mary or something, right? She's a perpetual virgin and sinless and just going on and on and on, uh, trying to drown out the gospel, right? Now, it's not on Paul or in this example here, Jesus, and their preaching. It wasn't like, oh, you did bad preaching. That's why everybody rejected the message. No, that's not how it is. You see, you might have found my preaching about homosexuality and transgenderism rude or what have you. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. Let's just say it was rude and consider it. It's the truth. Like if I told you two plus two is four, and if you don't believe it, you're an idiot. Okay, I'm being rude and inconsiderate. But that doesn't change the fact that two plus two is four. Just because of the way I went about it doesn't mean that's a reason to reject the truth that two plus two is four. You're not going to believe two plus two is four because I called you an idiot for not believing it? I mean, if that's the case, there's a mental issue going on. You have an, uh, an inner problem that you need to work out. And ultimately, that's the problem, is that these people's hearts, they're not right with God. So when you're doing preaching, sometimes what you're doing is you're pulling up weeds and you're pulling up stones and you're tilling the ground a bit there. You're throwing the seeds out there. Usually it's not you doing all that, but God is. You're kind of just planting the seeds and doing watering, giving some light and hoping something grows. But even though you do all those things, God gives the increase. So. Uh, you might not see the fruit of anything you do. Like Jeremiah, uh, he probably didn't see the fruit of anything he did. But he has his place in the Word of God. And it stayed. And it's been here for thousands of years. And we've learned from what he has taught and his from his life and everything. So he has fruit, fruit that has gone on after his death. Uh, even though he might not have seen any of it. Right? So, uh, yeah, you shouldn't be worried about being accepted or rejected. Uh, but I understand why. Right? You don't want to be the reason why people reject the truth. And you don't want to talk to somebody just for them to yell at you and spit in your face. Which seems to be for no reason. Just because you're, you're saying, hey, God says homosexuality is a sin. A, a rational person, if they didn't agree with you, they didn't believe you would just ignore you. If they can, they would just walk away, right? But some people, we know, they're not rational. They're not reasonable people. And just because you say your belief, they'll, they're going to say that you're trying to force it on them. But in reality, what they're saying is, I'm convicted by what you're saying, so you need to shut up. And then they're actually going to be hypocrites and do to you what they say that you're doing to them, and they're going to try to force you to deny your beliefs and accept their beliefs that homosexuality isn't bad, neither is transgender, and you need to accept all these things, right? But uh, that's why I say folly conviction. I'll give another reason why I say folly conviction is because Philip was on the road to Damascus, and he probably would have ran into a lot of people. But not a one of them did he preach the gospel to. He was told to come up to this uh, chariot to talk to a eunuch from Ethiopia. And that's who he talked to. Nobody else. Right? So, we see there that there's times you're convicted to say something to a group or maybe an individual. And that's what you do. But you don't have to sit there and make sure you get everybody going door to door and, and going to the, I don't know, gay pride parade or something like that, uh, preaching. Right? I mean, if you feel convicted to do it, by all means do it. But don't feel that, hey, it's on me. I have to make sure I reach everybody. Right? Because it's not. You just, you got to follow the conviction. You got to pray about it and follow God's leading. Because if you try to do things on your own, it, it's going to be fruitless. But if it's of God, it's going to be fruitful even if you don't see the fruit of it. 
So, uh, with that being said, thanks for watching. Take care. So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.